it's live. We're live. We're live. Hi, oh, hi, hi Ken. Everyone. Hi. We're like at all. Um, we're not at opposite sides of the earth, but we're pretty close. We're pretty far apart. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm Kate Elliott. You get to introduce yourself now. Oh, I, I thought you were going to say more. Okay. Well, no. I'm Ken Liu. <laughs> We both um, write books. We we both write books, and I actually have a copy of my book to show you. Oh, See? Oh, oh, I love I have that to I have to learn to uh, navigate this because you know I don't have my oh. camera set to mirror, so I have to sort of like translate the movements. Anyway, that's my book, uh, but that's not why we're here today. We're here to talk about uncomfortable. No, we're here. Fun. Sorry, sorry, Ken. We're here to talk about you too. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, you can't get out of it. This is my book, which I, as you just noticed, I had on the shelf too far away from my. See, I'm, I'm 20th century. I still use one of these. Um, well, people here are here to listen to us talk. And we discussed a little bit last week that we were going to talk about world building, right? Um, so where are we going to start, Ken? Well, you know, I actually had a question for you okay. um, right. as a jumping off point. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I think most people by now have heard that Unconquerable Sun is a gender spun space opera uh, of Alexander the Great in space. So do you want to say a little bit about what was it about the story of Alexander the Great that attracted you to tell it in the first um, place? I can. I'm a little worried that pe some people may be listening to us who haven't heard me, who have already heard me say this, but I bet there's people out there who haven't. So I don't know. It's just that I read a lot of Greek mythology when I was a child. I read, I must have read Edith Hamilton like 10 times. And that kind of brought me on to Greek history. Why Alexander the Great? I'm not actually sure, but you know, we, he's, he's a person who is valorized in history. The Romans loved him for whatever reason the Romans loved him, probably because they were an empire. And you know they could look at him and say he was a great conqueror. I don't know. Um, so a lot of our, a lot of what we know about him comes through these historians' view of him, which because we've lost the original sources, we have fragments of the original sources, the people who wrote about him at the time of his life and immediately after, the people who actually lived through that whole thing. But we mostly have the Roman sources, and so like everyone else, I read those, and like everyone else, I must have. Oh, I read Mary Renault. Um, and like everyone else, I read some biography or, uh, or other because I think a bi new biography of Alexander the Great comes out every three or four years because there's something about that. He did so much, he didn't stop. And then he died young, which is a spoiler, but that was like 2,320 something years ago. Anyway, so that story has, interested me enough that I actually named my older son Alexander. Um, and the, the part of this story that I have to add is that, so I have my first child, my eldest child, um, and then I got pregnant with what turned out to be twins. And I knew that, and I knew it was going to be boys before they were born. For those who don't know this story, I feel like I'm repeating myself constantly. But when I was maybe six or seven weeks pregnant, long before the ultrasound, and I am not a new age kind of person at all, I dreamed that there were two baby boys lying side by side underwater. So when I went into the ultrasound, I knew they were going to find twins. So anyway, so at the time I said, I want to name one Alexander and the other one um, Hannibal, but that's his middle name because you can't call the kid Hannibal because thank you, what's his name who wrote the Hannibal stories? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but the reason the one has the name Alexander, the Alexander, how we chose is that Alexander was famous for leading from the front. So first through the breach was Alexander. So for those of you who, and anyway, I don't know. I just love his story. And the reason I wanted to do a gender swap version is because I have worked my whole life, my whole career as a writer has been to focus on women in those in, as, in central roles in these adventurous stories of science fiction fantasy that I loved as a teenager, but that I never saw myself in. 
and that I wanted to be part of. So that kind of was the core. That's where it started. That's kind of the core there. But over the years, as you start, as you write more of these things, I would myself have to interrogate my own issues with what roles I would let women have and what roles women could have, even as they gained more and more roles. Um, and as those selection of roles expanded into more, more wide explorations of gender and you know outside binary gender and all those things. But one thing that I wanted to do finally was to write a woman in that charismatic military leader because we still see too few of those. Those are still mm -hmm. the Napoleons. They're still the Alexanders. And I wanted to say, what would it look like to have a woman in that role? And I admit being influenced by the 2016 election where in the United <laughs> States, we still can't say competent women are good choices for leaders. We still, it's not that we don't say that and it's not that a lot of people won't vote for someone who's competent for a woman who's competent, but that we still can fight about it constantly. We can still undermine it constantly. And I wanted to write a story in which the main character's ability to lead is never questioned, never. I, so I, that's, that's where it comes from. That's probably one of my um, uh, favorite things about the, the book. It's just that, you know, when I read it, um, uh, Sun is such a, charismatic character you know you, you you love her right away you know she's this great leader and it's just so cool to uh see that and you know compared to what you were saying one of the things that i really loved about reading that reading your book in the middle of all this is you know here you are seeing leaders who are competent who are actually planning things <laughs> and doing things effectively um you know it's a it's a nice bit of escape from the the reality we're in um you know a, a kind of dystopia that's designed not by an evil genius but it's just sort of sloppily right. slapped together so it, it's really rather nice that that I, I got to experience your book um one of the things i wanted to um take from what you just said is um so we're going to talk about history and world building. And I wanted mm -hmm. to uh, talk a little bit about the way history actually is used to build the very world we yeah. inhabit. So, you know, you mentioned a little bit of that already when you were talking about how uh, the story of, of how we, what sort of stories we tell about women leaders has uh, a, 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 a lot of um, power to shape the way we actually create the very world we live in. You know, the stories that we tell about women leaders shapes uh, the sort of leaders that we have and, and the kind of world we live in. One of the things that I wanted to bring up is, you know, both of us have written uh, epic fantasies inspired by history. And one of the things that I'm sure that you pay a lot of attention to is how historically history has been used to construct the world itself. So for example, right now, much of uh, Americans found uh, our founding mythology comes from this historical narrative we have about uh, what is classical Western civilization. Um, yeah. So we make a lot of references to Greece, a lot of references to uh, Rome. Uh, we make a lot of references to um, the Anglo-Saxon peoples. Um, and the founding fathers and 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 uh, even took on you know Roman names in order to sort of tell their story. They 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 modeled ourselves explicitly after um, a historical event. And uh, this is not fiction. This is actually how they constructed the world. Um, and and a lot of my epic fantasy and, and yours involve the same kind of thing. We 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 take historical inspirations. We create this world. Uh, based on them, but also in some ways, we're really exploring the meta narrative of how yeah. history itself becomes reinterpreted and reimagined and reincorporated into building materials for the very present. Alexander the Great, I mean, you know, my, my epic fantasy is based on the founding story of the Han Dynasty, but one of the things I wanted to do that is kind of interesting is even though it's it's based on that history, what I'm actually trying to do is to tell the story of America. Um, it's ultimately not a story about 
um, the Han Dynasty is really a story about America and how a new people comes, emerges um, out of uh, a set of legends. Um, and, and so, but historically, you know, it hasn't really been done to retell the story of America using a set of mythologies that are not based in classical Western um, uh, uh, self-narrative. So I think that's what makes the story to me interesting when I, when I was doing it. For you, for your story, what I found particularly interesting is that Alexander the Great is one of those stories that has been incorporated into so many historical narratives by other peoples. You know, Alexander is a very important figure yes. Uh, yes. in India, a very important figure in uh, 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 Persia. Uh, really, yeah, Persia, exactly, and, and much of Europe. Oh, yeah. um, so I wonder how much of that was in your mind as, as you were writing the story, the, not just Alexander, but also. Alexander as a mythological figure that has been reinterpreted by so many cultures in the interim? Well, absolutely, because Alexander, of course, was, as I already said, you know, the people who were there at the time wrote their histories. And then after he died, people wrote histories, and then the Romans took those histories. But what we don't know so much today, I mean, people know about it, but it's not so much in the larger popular knowledge base is that in the Middle Ages, there were there was something called the Alexander Romance, which were all mm -hmm. these different versions of stories. And it was one of the most popular. It, and by that, I mean, how many examples we have that have come down to us of copied versions, just stories of Alexander, some of which are based on history and some of which were just obviously made up folk stories and legendary stories. Those stories, as you said, they appear as far as India, where he is not perhaps as where he's not seen so much as a hero, obviously, and in Persia, right. which has a very mixed, um, he appears in, he's an important character. He has multiple chapters in uh, Abdul Qasim Ferdowsi's The Persian Book of Kings, the Shanama. Multiple chapters are given to him. And in this Persian version, he's the son of a pre Persian king. They mm -hmm. work, so they make that happen. And then there's, in the Alexander romance, there's a version in which he's the son of the last Egyptian pharaoh, which to me has to perhaps have come from Egypt, where he was welcomed because the Persians, the Egyptians at that time, didn't, they were happy to get rid of their Persian overlords. They didn't like them. So you, it's, so really, I'm just telling the same part. I'm just, I'm just another new iteration of this same story that's been told over and over again for over 2000 years. And I very much think of this as an example of in being in conversation with both the history and the legend. And but you know, what's, what's interesting is they're always told in conversation with the moment that the stories yeah. are yeah. told in. So like, yeah. like you were saying, you know, the story is in conversation with the moment we're living through. You know, this yeah. is a story yeah. about Alexander, but it's, it's for our moment. I don't think that science fiction can really be about the future. I think science fiction is always about the present. We're talking to ourselves about who we are and where we might be going. Um, I also think to actually to come back to something you said about founding myths and how we talk and how who gets to talk about history and what mm -hmm. they say, how that creates who we think we are. Um, we one of the things that science fiction and fantasy can do is that gives us that little bit of distance from, well, what we know about history. I don't want to say real history because what we know about history is mixed, right? But it gives us a little distance to explore some of those things in a way that isn't, doesn't put us right into the middle of them. And I think that distance lets people read something and see the parallels, see how narrative works, see how narrative tells us these stories at the same time as it can comment on or be in conversation with our present moment. So, uh, you know, your your princess son is such an interesting character because she's so conscious of that process. She's she's so conscious of the fact that she's constructing a narrative for herself that will lift her into, you know, the destiny that 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 she's supposed to have throughout. She's a she's one of the most deliberate, you know, uh, persons in terms of like constructing her own story and, and planning where it's going and, and saying, this is this is a gesture I'm gonna make and this is a thing that I'm gonna do in order to craft another piece of the story that I'm telling that other people will also tell about me. I, I found that really fascinating. Well, you know, I also wanna point out that the other important leader 
in this story at, at, is her mother, Irene, mm -hmm. who of course is there. For those who are interested in how much I use the actual history of Alexander, um, I used a fair bit of it, but it's not exact, but there are some direct analogs and Irene is meant to be an analog of Philip. Philip is an absolutely fascinating figure. Um, he's, he's actually pretty amazing because he inherited the throne of Macedonia after his two older brothers had both been killed in battle serially. Um, and the kingdom was on the edge of collapse that Athenians were about to move in and take it over. Um, the, you know, the Persians were kind of poking their noses in. He had no money. He had no army. They had all died with his one brother. Um, he had been held hostage in Thebes for a few years as an adolescent. And yet he built, he built the army that Alexander used. And a lot of times the focus on Alexander ignores what Philip did. And so I wanted to show Irene as someone who has maybe built this sense of propaganda and how she, if she controls the media and history and how we talk about things, then she controls how people see what she's doing. Um, and she's in a way the pragmatic, the pragmatic basis that Sun comes out of. Because Sun doesn't exist without Irene, just as Alexander doesn't exist without Philip. So that's a deliberate, and it's also, it's also a commentary on the U.S.'s typical idea of the self-made man, right? Right. I came right. out of nowhere and did everything, but actually people don't come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's vanishingly rare that someone comes out of nowhere. They come out of a place and they have, they come out of a context, they come out of a background, they have people who help them or people who put barriers in their way. So it's it's important to understand that context. We're always the continuations of another story already in progress. Yes. Even as much as we want to pretend that is not the case. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the U.S., other cultures very much see this sure. as a continuum. I read the Shanama in translation, obviously, with Tessa Grattan a, some, a few years ago, and it was fascinating because it's always calling back to the history. It's always calling back to those who came yeah. before. Nobody comes out Nobody springs fully formed from the head of Zeus. And even Athena came from it, Zeus, it, right? So she didn't it, come from. It, it's true. Mm -hmm. it, it actually is very interesting sort of think about the extent to which um, in the U.S. here, we have become so enamored the mythology of, of the individual um, that we don't even like to talk about our own politicians in that way. You know. Um, oftentimes, I think people are sometimes surprised to hear that some politician is related to, you know, comes from a, a very yeah. prominent political family, how, you know, you go back several generations, uh, you know, someone was so and so. Um, we don't tend to emphasize those things in the biographies we give of people. We, we like to emphasize the idea that they're self-made somehow. Um, it is interesting to, to explore the extent to which we like those kind of narratives and, and how we even consciously blind ourselves to the to to the extent that that it's actually not true you know it's 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 interesting well and it's a choice you can make when you're world building too and i think it's one that both you and i have done you've definitely done it with the dandelion dynasty uh which with, with this idea that we have to see the individuals the individuals exist in the context of their community in the context mm -hmm. of their families in the context of their culture and to me frankly as a reader and as a writer that's more interesting than this sole figure who's wandering through the wilderness with no connection to anybody i don't i it's the connections to me that make people interesting and that also drive the best conflicts mm -hmm. absolutely so switching topics a little bit um I notice you you make a lot of really fascinating um, world building choices. I mean, you know, you've got the space battle tactics, you've got the geography of this three dimensional map. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about what was the most fun thing you did in the world building for for this novel, and and what was your least favorite part? Well, my least favorite part is that I still don't have a complete three-dimensional map of the <laughs> system. 
I can't even, man. Okay. That's my least favorite part. We'll just leave that there for the moment. Um, okay. So when I decided I was going to do this, I had to make a decision and I knew I was going to do gender swapped Alexander this great in space. And I had to make a decision between make it a full secondary world. I'll call that the star Wars model with no connection to earth or connect it to earth. Mm -hmm. Um, I decided that the going the Star Wars model would actually be more work and less fun because everything is new. They have to, every context is something you have to create for the reader. And one of the things I think people reading Star Wars are going to see the films now is that, that it's a big event now to go see the latest film or to play the game or to see the Mandalorian with baby Yoda. What, why? Cause everyone, I love baby Yoda. So cute. I love baby Yoda anyway, but this is all based on 40 years, 40 years of, of a studio arm that has a, a incredible ability to create games publish multiple, multiple, I don't know, dozens, hundreds of books by now, um, multiple films, cartoons. So our relationship with Star Wars is based on that long 40 years now of relationship. Well, I don't have that, right? I have to do it right away. I got one book to create a relationship with people. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, there's going to be a connection to earth, but I also didn't want to write kind of a near future. We know where worst earth yep. is. And because Alexander the Great lived in the ancient world, and because he's separated from Sumeria and Acadia by the same distance that we're separated from him, right? I, th I decided to go with the idea that Earth is separated from the people in this world by the same distance we're separated from Ur. So what do we know about Ur? We have we have archaeological sites, we have some writing which people have only, you know, which people have can now read. Um, what do we really know about what life was like there? I mean, it's mixed and we have to put together, we have to put together a lot of we have to draw some connections that may or may not be there. But for me as a writer, if I'm writing to people who live in the present and who have these things, when I start putting in these connectors and these Easter eggs, people come to that with a context. So the connections they're making, they, they're either, you know, they, they're with me and they go, oh, I know what that is. Oh, I got that. I got that reference to Pacific Rim, right? Or they can say, oh, knights don't ride dinosaurs. <laughs> so, they can, so, so you're, it's kind of like letting you're, so for me, it was doing two things. I was letting the reader in on some in-jokes, which connects them because they feel like they're now part of the context. Um, and then I was also trying to write a story about how do we understand history when we only have fragments and we can't put it all together. So we take those fragments and we put them together in a way that may not reflect what was really happened, what really happened in the past. So that for me was the most fun. And, and just this idea of history, what it, it goes back to what you said originally, what is history? History is a story we tell ourselves. And when there's missing pieces, we have to, we will end up using our own understanding to put them together, pro possibly, probably in a way that doesn't really reflect. But you know, that's the part that I, I like the most when you were doing that as part of world building, right? The, the the very way that the people in your world fill in the blanks shows, reveals us a lot about the way they think yeah, and, and what they yeah. consider important, which is, you know, I think it's just a brilliant way to do your world building. It's the, the missing stuff is, um, and how they fill that in tells us so much about who they are and, and what they value and, and why they are the way they are. Um, I thought that was really cool. And I thank you, thank you. I, and I had to differentiate the different cultures without exotifying any of them. Mm -hmm. So I picked different ways to do that, that, um, that 
Well, anyway, I pick different ways to do that. By and, and they're not they're not all the same. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's one of the the things that you do um, that is uh, that I don't hear a lot of people talk about, but that, but I, I think is really important. Um, you do this thing that I I sort of describe as um, uh, world building or or character building um, through stories. So so here's what I mean. Um, oftentimes when we try to get the reader to uh, be investing a character or to get a sense of a character, we focus a lot on things like um, what they look like, what they wear, what what their what their um, um, how they right how they present yeah. themselves, their favorite yeah. flavor of ice cream, for lack of a better you know example. Um, and the thing is, those things are not that important. That's not how you really get to know someone. That's not how you get a sense of someone in real life anyway. Um, or sometimes we do things that are a little bit better, which is to show them reacting to a crisis or do something. That's a little better because you know the way someone behaves does tell us a little more about them. But I think the best way you, you get to know someone is really mirrors how you get to know someone in real life, which is you understand their stories, how, what stories define for them the meaning of courage, what stories define for them the meaning of love, what stories define for them the meaning of um, being respected, being being loved, being safe. And that's what you sort of do, right? You, you, the, the way your characters become so meaningful and interesting is they are, um, you reveal over time what are the defining stories for them. That That is what ends up being important. And I think that's just such a important part of character building and, and, and world building. It's, it's not about describing the 200 different ways that people spell their names or whatever, you know, it's not, it's really not. Those things are not that important. What, what ends up being um, really important to, in terms of getting a sense of a character, a family, a culture is really learning about their their fundamental stories, the stories that make these abstract values meaningful to them. And then I think that was really cool how you brought that in over and over again and put layers on top of them. It's very I, cool. I you know and I have to say that when I started out as a writer, I would I did tend to go a little more with the if I put my stage set up here, people will say, Oh look, we're in early medieval Europe. And then you, you hope, but then you realize that people are bringing their context of that yeah. into the book. And so you've got to create context for them because the goal is you do this. I, I've told you this before, but in Grace of King, you're dealing with a social structure that's patriarchal. Mm -hmm. And there's in the first two thirds of that book, there's only a couple women who are important to the story. And they don't have, you know, they're 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 defined with their relationships to men, and you kind of read it, and you're like, well, whatever. But then you use that, and this is a spoiler, but I don't care. Um, two thirds of the way through, you take all that understanding which you have created, and then you turn it over, and all of a sudden, someone smart enough to understand this in the story realizes that he can use this to his benefit and people caught up in the story realize who are fr who have perhaps been frustrated women caught up you know realize that they have they can use this crisis as an opportunity because we the reader understand where it comes from it's mm -hmm. much more meaningful because you don't have to tell us it just happens we're right. like we're there on the journey and i think a to me, really good world building lets the reader at some point understand the world well enough that you don't have to explain things anymore. They they get it because now right. they know it. Yeah. Yeah. The way I describe it is it's world building has to be, you know, a participatory process. I think Joel Walton yeah. was one who said it's really yeah. world conjuring. It's 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 you you right. have to get the reader to participate almost as much as you yourself. And so, you know, like like you were saying, you know, what I wanted to do with the Braves of Kings was to um, put the reader in a position where the reader is actually deeply frustrated with the way yeah. the narrative is is deliberately limited. Uh, the narrative celebrates its own um, narrowness, uh, and and you as the reader becomes increasingly frustrated with the way it's being done, um, and and then that way you participate eventually in the. Uh, 
uh, in the in the breakdown of that narrative and the way it has to be restructured. Uh, the more you as the reader can be involved in that process, I think mm -hmm. the more impactful it is. And you know, I think that's what you do a lot in in your books, but um, in Unconquerable Sun especially, there's a huge amount of 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 um, there. You, you you do this thing where it's you know the the story you're telling on the surface requires the reader to pay attention to all sorts of details and to really fill in the blanks and to be really deeply involved. If if you're not, in, it's, it's not it's not one of those books where um, you know uh, the way I picture it is there are some stories where it's it's um, you as the reader are expected to just sort of watch the things being painted. You're just passively sitting there and everything's described to you, everything's explained to you, how people feel, how you should feel, why, you know, here's an exciting moment, boom, 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 you know, here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a moment where you should feel sad. You know, it's like everything's being described to you. I, I feel like that's sort of the very opposite of the aesthetic you're going for, where you don't do much of that at all. So much of what you do is um, you you hold back, you hold back. You, everything is like not even 80%, it's more like 70%. So much of, of what's going on is the reader has to actually go in and figure out and, and really yeah. be in, but it, it really draws them in. You know, I, 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 I think that's really, the, the way you can underwrite is really very powerful. I, I have to tell you, I don't do that. It's not a deliberate choice. I keep telling myself <laughs> that someday I'm going to write a book that just you can just read. There's not you don't have to like put together five pieces to get what's going on. But I yep. haven't done it yet. I can't figure out. I anyway, you know. Well, I, guess, I, I I appreciate it. I I like the way this is done. Thank you. Turn. Thank you. I mean, I guess we write what's in us to write, right? We, yep. we it, it, you try to write something that isn't there it's not gonna come out, it's not gonna be authentic to whatever your artistic vision is. And it can be frustrating at times, but also when you're really in it, you know that feeling when you're in it, you're there. It's like, there's no better feeling than knowing that you're bringing something up on the page that people are gonna be in, like you said, they're gonna be emotionally invested in, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you want. You want the reader to feel that I hate to use that term investment it feels so capitalistic, but um, uh, yeah, I know yeah, we don't even have a good language no. for this. But anyway, go on. <laughs> well, we 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 prop. I'm sure there are good languages for this, but American culture, especially, has kind of shoved them aside. It's kind of pushed them away. But yeah, you want the reader to be there in that journey with you. You want them to yeah. be walking that street. That, I mean, that's my goal. It's not, and it doesn't have to be the goal of every writer. People can have different ways they want to they want to create their stories and interact that story with the reader. But this is just the one that I, and, and you, because I've read the half of your, <laughs> <laughs> and I know the other half is coming. So of your, of Dandelion Dynasty. So, yeah. Yeah. So there we are, right. You know, we're yeah, either, I mean, we're, we're either stuck it, with it or we're fortunate or I, I think I think we're stuck with it. But but you know, I I, I just I, I I can't imagine doing it any other way because yeah. I feel like the books where they where a storytelling technique where um things are presented to you and you're not asked to make judgments and to to jump in and to demonstrate your understanding of the rules of the world just isn't very engaging. You you kind of have to give the reader things to do. The more you give the reader to do, I feel like the better it is. Um, and uh, I, I mean, at least that's how I feel. And I, when I'm reading your books, it's always fun because I feel like I'm doing a lot of work. You know, it's like I'm trying to figure this out. I'm like, wait, wait, what? You know, it's supposed to be like, easy. You're supposed to be able to read the surface story and not work. And then if you want to work, you can work. Right. I I, don't, I, I figure people read for different reasons. Um, yeah. There's there's great books out there that I can't read because they just don't float my boat or whatever, right? But I'm glad they're there for people for whom they work. Um, I like the variety. So, but but this is what I do. I, you know, I have like for the Crossroads universe, I have two thick notebooks with all the, and I just made, I printed out all this information about it. Oh, so I, 
this is this i'm curious now uh, about your your process so um i've mentioned before that the way i do world building is um you know i draw maps i uh write pseudo encyclopedia wikipedia articles for myself uh you know that's that's how i do world building i have to you actually build write things batteries down. you build batteries right. in your garage and then there, they there's explode, also that right because right. if you yeah. if you don't do these things it doesn't really work you know I, I feel like if you don't do all that work um it doesn't quite feel real and also it's a great way to procrastinate um what is your what's your process like like what do you do what, what are the things that you do to to make sure you know the world um i like to get my first basis which you may or may not have a map it used to always have a map it doesn't so much anymore um well, maybe that's just what I like to get my first basis, which is like, how am I going to approach this? And then I find that I write. Well, let me give an example of, from Cold Magic, actually. So the genesis of Cold Magic, which is the spirit, the first book of the Spirit Walker trilogy, which is an alternate fantasy. It's alternate history only with magic. So it's not really alternate history, but it's set in the 19th century um, I call it the Afro-Celtic post-Roman fantasy adventure ice punk uh, with Phoenician spies and lawyer dinosaurs. So it's uh, a lot. But the genesis of that book was I had a scene in my head, and it's a visual for me, of two young women sitting in like a window seat on the second story looking down on a courtyard and they see a carriage come up and they know that there's something in that carriage that's going to be a problem, maybe dangerous. So from that, I knew that it was set in like an 18th, 19th century landscape because the carriage was that way and the windows were that way. And I kind of pictured them wearing that. So that was where it started. And then everything built from there. But I don't like do a whole world building Bible before I start because so much of what I do comes out as I work. So yeah. I'll have you a have basis. Explore. Yeah. I need a foundation. I need to know the basis of where I am, but so much of it is discovery and I can't reproduce that. If I just sit down and make stuff up, mm -hmm. it has mm -hmm. to happen organically with me and the characters and the plot discovering this thing. Um, together and then i try to write stuff down so i can remember stuff later does that then, process ever get you, get you into trouble i mean you know it, it gets me into trouble because i'm such always. a discovery writer so oftentimes when i'm in the later books in the series i often i'm like oh wow you know had i known back then what i know I'm, now i wouldn't have done things this way i keep telling myself that someday someday i will have the ability that not the ability to but the uh financial security to write an entire trilogy before i start publishing it but wow, i don't write so now. different it will be so different you right can write the whole thing and then you could make sure every little single thing was but because every story i've done i've had to like go back and say wait i said this here now how can i retrofit that into this so that it won't be a contradiction um and then sometimes you get the opposite thing where you go, wait, I said this in the first book and it totally fits here. Like this I'm a genius, right? I'm a genius. <laughs> yes, that yes, yes. The fourth um Jaron book, there's a moment in there that literally it looks like I've set it up from the beginning. Yeah. And I had it. It just the landscape. See, this again is that thing about creating landscapes that that have inter not just internal consistency, but they have their own life to them. When you put them together, then people and situations will come together and you didn't even know it and you realize you've already got the solution or the conflict right there mm -hmm. and i love that that's yeah the those best. are the best moments those yeah. are the best moments yeah yeah but yeah i i often have I, I i do really love it when those moments happen you know i'm often like see i i said this in book one this is i didn't even yeah. know this is going to be useful yeah. now yeah. and it yeah. is it's perfect yeah but but a lot of time is spent like tearing out hair and saying, why did I do this? Because now I really wish I had done it that way. Um, but, oh well. 
See, capitalism. No, that's, that's what capitalism does to us. See, but it also right, makes right. you more creative, right? It, it does. Our, right, our right. reactions are just very different to this because, you know, when I when I experience these moments, what I think of is there has to be a technological solution to this problem, right? What, what I wish is, you know, why is it that all the writing software that we have, you know, there ought to be some way to help novelists make these kind of world building consistency issues. Like, it's not saying that, I'm not saying that they need to anticipate, but, you know, it will be nice if if after you, you've made some decisions in world building, you know, there can be some sort of neural network that can process what you've got and then make predictions and say, Ken, Ken, <laughs> Ken that's, our, that's our brain, Ken. <laughs> no, no, there, there needs to be some sort of artificial intelligence to help us tell better stories. That's what I want. I, I, I want some sort of machine to help us, you know, say, okay, so here's a decision that you can make. It will be even better if you did this. But see, here's the thing. Here's the argument I would make. I would say that it is our very imperfection that makes narrative work. There you go. Agree. There. I've I solved totally that. agree. I've solved I, that. Right. I totally agree with you, 100%. Well, so oh, you never, you never actually did tell me what was the most fun thing you had. Oh, the Easter uh, eggs. The Easter eggs. No one will get them all. It's a challenge. Oh, that's to true. New readers, there's true. a lot. I know, I know one of there's them. There's a lot yeah. in there. Yes. Which one? Uh, the ones we talked about. Oh, about right, the name. Right. Yes. So. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. The the yeah the the main, I think it's nine, it's nine, right? Nine, yeah. The, the yeah. main, well, then you can't tell because I never list them. Um, right. In Kaonia, Kaonia has a three name system. People have three names and they're, they basically have a, a, a given name, a surname and a place name. And the surnames, the, core the founding surnames have are an easter egg yep so Someday. Yes, those yeah. are those are fun stuff the fun yeah. things that you can yeah. do yeah and they're ken's fault because he told me something because <laughs> ken helped me with the with the mandarin with the pinion of those and then he told me something in the course of an exchange that and i said oh, i've got to use that so thank you yeah. ken yeah which are the best do you want to do some questions? We could do some questions. I know Christian's lurking back there, hidden in the shadows, like a mage waiting to uh, tell us something, unless he fell asleep. I don't know. I was going to show Finn, but he's sleeping over there in the chair. Finn? No. No. No, uh, not interested. He's, he's, yeah, he's so if slipping. you if you readers have any questions for Kate, you go go ahead and put them in there. Uh, I think this will be. Um, or you can have really questions cool. for Ken too. You should ask Ken a lot of questions. Well, I promised people that you were going to share with them pro tips and the secrets pro to. Pro tips, the secrets. <laughs> right, the secrets to telling awesome stories. So. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm leaving it up to you. <laughs> I, have, I actually, I have, I have a tip. I have a tip, which is allow yourself to make mistakes, a mm -hmm. lot of mistakes. And it's okay. Cause that's, I don't know any other way to get better. Um, other than making mistakes. Um, Christian, can you tell us on the private chat, whether we have any questions? Cause if we don't, we can keep talking. Oh and yeah. We, can talk forever. Um, uh, he says, oh, no questions okay. so far. No questions okay. so far. Well, we're gonna keep on talking, but if you have questions, leave them, and then we can we can talk about okay. them. So, is the second book written, done? It's How writing. close are we? It's writing. I don't want to talk about that. Okay. It's, okay. I'm right. writing it. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's hard because we we've talked a little bit about pandemic brain. Yeah, we should talk about that maybe. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, I it's... think a lot of people are struggling with writing, even in circumstances where they might think they would write well, because you don't have maybe, well, you have more distractions if you have children at home, um, if you have concerns about money or whether you can eat, you know, or whether you're going to get sick and, and then just everything, the whole 
the whole atmosphere around it, it's hard. It's hard to create. I got nothing done for three and a half months. Uh, nothing. I mean, I wrote nothing. No blog post. Um, just nothing. I edited my, you know, the the conclusion to the uh, Dungeon Dynasty a little bit, maybe maybe uh, a couple hundred words. But for three and a half months, really, I was just uh, doom scrolling the whole time. There was nothing. Um, valuable, productive being done. And, you know, I, I felt bad about it, but, you know, what else can you do? You kind of have to just sometimes accept that when you're going through times like that, you just have to go yeah. through it. Um, you know, what ended up bringing me a lot of joy is finally reading some books, like your book and uh, also uh, Rebecca Ronhorse's new uh, Black Sun, fantasy. which I'm reading, yeah. yeah, which is really good. Yeah. Coming in October. Oh, exactly. So I read those and uh, and, and that that brought me a lot of joy and and and, and uh, ended up actually allowing me to um, start writing again. So I was able to do a novella um, as a result of um, uh, being able to uh, um, finally get through that patch of deep anxiety. I mean, you know, it's not like I'm saying somehow the world is better and everything is perfect. It's, it's just that more like I'm reminded again of, of the value of stories and how sometimes the way you get through it is to just accept that things are terrible and then try to tell a story that helps to make sense of it and, and, and get you through it. Uh, I don't know of any other way. You know, it's not like there's a magical bullet that somehow will just make things go back to normal. It's not. We're just going to have to live through it. And, and yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, humans are pattern makers. That's how we function. That's how our brains have developed. And stories are kind of like the patterns we use to understand, like, as you know, as we've been discussing, that that's how we understand the cosmos. And it, it strikes me, not just that this is how we get through a time like this, but it's how people have always gotten through times like these. And of course, we've always been living, someone has always been living in times like these. Yes. Some people, some people have just had the privilege not to have to be that, you know, be constantly bombarded and assaulted by it. And it's also in the context of some of the stuff I'm seeing in publishing now with stories that wouldn't have been published 40 years ago being published is that you see how important it is that this idea that those stories didn't exist, but they always existed. And it's so important now to see how much bigger the narrative universe is that humans have always lived in and that other people have always known. Um, if I say I didn't see those stories before, it didn't mean they didn't exist. It just means I didn't see them. So, yeah, that's right. You know. I, I mean, I, I think that's the, that's the thing. Sometimes people don't, um, um, it's, it's, you know, this goes back to that whole thing about we don't emphasize enough here in, in America the sense of continuity we have with yeah. all those who come before yeah. us. You know, a lot of times we, we default to the idea of exceptionalism that what we're doing is just completely unprecedented. There's no, there's no, there's no sense of continuity with previous generations or previous peoples. But, but the reality is, you know, I think we can take a lot of comfort in the fact that in some sense, you know, deep anxiety, suffering and, and pain has always, they've always been there and, and we are living through another iteration of it. But, but, but cur so uh, courage and, and strength and um, stories of hope that get us through it. You know what I mean? So that's, that's how I feel about it. Yeah, I, my dad was a history teacher and he talked some about how the American experiment tended to have that disconnect from history. It was like, well, we left. We didn't all leave, right? A lot of people were all, some people were already here, but there's, it's just this disjunction. It's about separation. Um, but if you don't learn history, if you don't understand history, then you, it, it creates, well, it creates the situation we're in now. And that's a dangerous, it's dangerous not to be connected to the past, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think that's, it, we don't acknowledge the extent to which historical narratives are used to 
define the very world we're in. You know, so, so much of the resistance you hear from people about re-examining our history and trying to um, come to a reckoning with it right now is about that yeah. sense that history yes. doesn't really matter, yes. that we're not actually part yeah. of the history, but but we are. And we're absolutely part it's, of history. It's easy to say you're not when you're part of, you know, of, of the class that basically are winners, but it's not so easy to say it doesn't matter when you have to live with the consequences on a daily That's basis. Right. That's so. right. Um, I think we're going to segue to a few questions. Someone has asked about Sun being curious at first, but she's more acquisitive. And I assume by acquisitive. Um, so thank you about that. What I want to say about Sun is that there's an element of her character that I take directly from what people talk about, uh, about Alexander the Great. And of course, the most famous, I have to take that post-it note off because it's um, got spoilers on it. Anyway, here's Arian, the campaigns of Alexander. So Arian was a Roman historian who wrote one of the best known, um, it's not really a biography, but anyway, Alexander was known in the ancient world and you see this a little bit in the other stories as well and in the Alexander romance as having pothos, which means like longing and not and, and longing for like what's over that hill or what am I going to achieve and that's the element of sun when the, it's not acquisitive I don't think of it so much as acquisitive in like like a dragon wanting a hoard right I want to <laughs> sit on all this gold that, uh, that too. But, but that's one of the things I'm trying to do with this character is this idea of pothos of, of longing for something so Oh, yeah, that's so, really cool. I love that. Wow. We'll see. That's that's very cool. It's I, I, tough, I never even thought of that, but that's cool. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a tough. That kind of character is a tough one to write. I've written these kind of charismatic military geniuses before, but in all my other books, they have not had points of view. You see them only from the outside. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, Kamjiata in the Spirit Walker trilogy is a very obvious Napoleon analog. Um, cross That's interesting. I, I guess you're right because it's usually they're they're they're, they're just part of the story. They're they're part of the landscape, the the spiritual landscape of of your POV character story, but they're not, they're not, you're not actually looking out of their eyes and, and explaining that longing why they want to do this, you know, build this, this, this. Well, thing. I'm not what sure they're very sympathetic. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm not sure I want to, it's interesting because I, I think because I grew up in, you know, I was born in and grew up in the US, I'm really interested in empire. What is empire? And probably because my dad, you know, taught history as well. But this whole process of empire, when I was 17 or 16, it would have been 16, I wrote a paper comparing the Roman Empire and the American Empire and how the American Empire was eventually going to fall. I just didn't think it would be yet, right? Um, I mean, it's not yet yet, but we're there. We're on, we're in that, we're going through that same process. So for some reason, that's always, that's kind of like my meta interest as a writer. I don't know why, but it's there, um, this idea of empire. Um, so I'm always writing about it. And this is my first attempt to go inside that mindset. Right. And it's, but it's I, I challenging. You've, you, you've chose, well, it, it probably will get even more challenging as you go it on. Will. Right? It yeah. will. And I'm in book two and it will. Right. Well, yeah. right now, you know, I, I, I love the part before Sun has become, you know, who she will become, you know. Right now, we're sort of knowing her in the in the moment when she's still in the process of, of becoming. Um, it, it is really fascinating to see you explain that whole longing because that 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 now that I think of it, that is a big part of um, the legends about Alexander. The 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 sense in which he's always saying, you know, uh, you know, what's over there? What's in India? You know, we want to go yeah, over yeah, to yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, I want to. I'm looking here at the comments. So, did you find yourself questioning military force as the standard for powerful leadership while writing, um, mm. and and whether someone being powerful should be defined by conquest? Absolutely. Uh, I 
my, my crown of stars seven volume epic fantasy I like to call as a seven volume Annie War novel uh, <laughs> that I wrote uh, 20 years ago now. But um, it one of the interesting things, so yes, I do question it. And I also chose to write this story. So that's a contradiction. And that contradiction I hope is present in the text. Um, Ken, someone wants to know if your world building process is different for short stories. Oh, uh, wow, okay. Uh, hmm. uh, it is, um, if I can sort of describe it, it's more of a qualitative thing than, than anything I can point to specifically, but it's more that um, when I'm doing a short story, I don't have to answer as many questions as I do for a novel, mainly because um, I can leave a lot more of it in the background. Um, uh, it's, it's when, when I'm telling a short story, really, there's just really one very straightforward plot and just a few characters interacting. And I just need to answer enough questions about the world to make their actions make sense and to explain their motivations. Um, I can pick out one interesting idea about the world and just focus on that and leave the, the vast majority of what you have to do to make the world plausible and complete undefined. That's, that's totally okay. I don't need to know the answers and the reader doesn't care. And so it is what it is. I just need to have a very small piece of it. It's sort of like those movie sets where, you know, you, 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 you see what you see on camera, but if the camera just moved a little bit to the side, you'll, you'll see it. it's all, there's nothing there. There's nothing um, there. Right. But with a short story, it's okay. You can do that. With novels, I, I feel like I can't really do that at all, as well, mainly because um, you're staying with the characters for so long, you're telling a bigger story and, and you end up hitting those spots you thought you would never go. And then you have to go back and, and re-examine your assumptions and then maybe redo things. I don't know if, Kate, you did, you've done this, but for me, I've had situations where I've made certain decisions on page 10 and, and by page 430, I, I'm, I'm sort of like, oh, okay, uh, that was not a good idea. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. I have to go back and rethink this whole thing because um, I'm now just putting epicycles on epicycles and just to handle this thing. And it's, it's, it's not making sense. I have to redo the whole thing. Um, with short stories that rarely happens just because you don't tend to go into the areas that you're leaving undefined with novels that tends to be not the case. So I ended up having to do a lot more detailed, um, world building and thinking through the implications of my decisions. Um, it's, you know, just a different kind of experience. I'm not saying one is better than the other. Um, they're both very fascinating ways uh, of, of exploring uh, a world and writing story. Yeah, it's like you could walk down the hall without opening all the doors. But when you yeah. write a novel, you kind of got to open all the doors. Um, that makes sense to me. It's why I can't, it's why I struggle to write short fiction because I end up wanting to tell you everything about the world. I, I, I do the same too. I, I you know, I, I think I told you this uh, after you gave me my first gold star, you know, I was telling you how I can't, uh, I can't write um, short stories <laughs> right. anymore. It's like, it's, right. it feels like fairly enough to introduce a character, you know, how are you going to be able to tell a whole story? It's yeah. Yeah. I admire you. You've written a lot of short stories. I admire people who can write short fiction. Um, it's I'm working on it kind of, I, I wanted to quickly, I think we're actually running oh, got two minutes. Um, because usually it seems like the approaches to women in power, oh, this is a follow on from the previous question about military force as a standard for leadership. Um, usually it seems like the approaches to women in power are giving women male roles or redefining what forms of power matter. Do you find yourself working between these approaches? I absolutely do. I. Um, and it's that's really well phrased and succinctly phrased. I usually have to write a trilogy to get that same amount of information across. Um, I very much try to look at, I very much try to rethink what we consider important and powerful, what we consider to be valued um, and what different forms of power, you know, there's that old idea of about power over versus power with, 
right? And um, so I'm always, again, working on that conflict and contradiction in my own work. It's one of the core things that I think I do when I write. That's a really short answer. Um, and I want to quickly, uh, are you happy to see there's more space being made in publishing for female authors and female protagonists, especially compared to when I first started out? Yes, it, this is a, a great, great time to be writing a wider range, and I'm gonna say a wider range of gendered characters because there's now we're able to look outside that that old US Western binary and look at people, at human beings. Um, I think we're seeing more, a wider range of what I would call realism, true representation of the range of people as they are and who they are. Um, Ken, we are uh, almost. I think we're we're. Have we run out of time? Do we still have time? We are for, almost. Um, we have. Well, we're at two o'clock. So. Okay. Are we gonna well, you want to say we do one more minute. One one last. What, what what's your final thought on on Conquerable Sun? What do you want people to remember at the end of this? Well, that's a hard question. Ha! That's a hard question. Um. I want, you know what, the question, what I want them to feel at the end of it was to get to the end of the story and go, yes, right? Um, that's what I want. And I, yeah, that's what I want. I mean, isn't that what we want? We want people to that's feel satisfied. That's definitely what we want. And I definitely felt that. At the end of the book. Um, yep. And at the end of a story, that's what writers want when we, when we share our, our stories with people. Absolutely. And you know, that story got me out of my uh, very depressed state. So, you know, go for it. I think oh. I think it's a it's a good story. So Okay, I think we are. It's been great to talk to you as always. Ken, this is like the third kind of iteration of our Worldcon world building panel. That's that right. Because we, we're not able to do it in us. person this year. Yeah. But you know, at least we so, got to do it this way. So yeah, so we'll yeah. we'll do it again. It's a real pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah, uh, thank you, all of you, Facebook. for being here. And um, Christian will do whatever he needs to do. All right, I guess we should say I bye. Yeah, we should say yeah. bye. At some point, bye, we'll everyone. Be. Thank okay. you. Bye.